In this video I'm going to explain the different features of my Blender preset file for Factorio renders. You can get the file in the script with the link in the description. The video has five major chapters which you can access via the timestamp function. The first part is about view layers and the second one is about scene structure and contents. Next step I'll explain the whole thing about light groups and after that we'll cover the whole composition tab and export settings. At the end I will show you how to use my scripts. View layers in Blender allow you to create multiple render setups within a single scene. They enable you to control which objects, lights and collections are visible in a specific render pass, making it easier to create different versions of a scene without duplicating it. In our case that's beneficial because they allow us to export multiple sprite types in one render go. With view layer overrides you can change properties like materials or visibility of specific layers, ensuring flexibility in compositing. Additionally, view layer passes let you render individual elements such as shadows, reflections or ambient occlusions separately, giving you more control in post-processing. Depending on what special renders you need, you might need to enable some so they will appear in the compositing tab. By configuring which collections are visible in each view layer, you can isolate shadows, lights and normal objects into distinct passes. This is essential for precise control and post-processing. You can switch between them up here or create new ones here. With copy settings, you basically just duplicate a whole layer. And for us to be able to export color, shadow, light, color mask and even water reflection sprites, our scene needs to have a certain structure. Down below you have the scene collection which contains the ambient lights, the shadow plane, the shadow sun, the camera and the grid. The objects you want to render are in the object collection. Everything that does not have a color, mask or anything to do with lights just goes into the normal collection. If you have a part that's supposed to be in the color mask sprites, you gotta have a colored and an uncolored version. The uncolored version just acts as another normal object but gotta be in its own collection. The colored one also gets its own collection. For it to only render the color mask object in the color mask view layer, the normal objects are on holdout, so they obstruct the mask objects. In every other layer, they are just invisible. The collections in the shadow layer are on indirect only, so we only get to see the shadow on the shadow catcher plane that is shine on by the shadow sun. If your factorial objects have lights or glow or light sprite layer, you need to put them into these light collections. All light objects and emissive meshes go into the lights on one and another non-emitting variant goes into the lights off collection. This is necessary for shadow and water reflection rendering since those work with the alpha channel. I, or rather ChatGPT, made a script for easier handling the resolution and render scale. In the end panel you can find this factorial tab which gives you some values to play with. Clicking on set resolution will set the scene's output resolution to orthographic scale times tile size, which is the correct way to get in-game resolution sprites. The orthographic scale is driving the active scene camera. Driven values are appearing pink and can be edited like this and created like that. The orthographic scale is basically the scope your orthographic camera is having. It is identical with the tile size in-game if you set the tile size to 64 pixels. Some people like to have a visual grid to see how big their asset is going to be in in-game tiles. That's done via the grid object. It's doing some geometry nodes magic to appear directly in front of the camera and overlay the in-game grid. Its size is driven by the orthographic scale again. If you want an even grid, you can set that option here. Another factory mod creator called Hickory had the original idea and concept for the grid. They however had a relative scale version and not an absolute version like mine. While in my version the orthographic scale scales the grid with it, in theirs you can set the O scale and grid scale independently from each other with these values. I'm a bit bold and say that most models probably won't need the relative variant because it's just relevant when you don't want to scale your model but the camera scale instead. Hickory also came up with a procedural pipe ending object that I included with their permission. Again there's two versions, my fixed scale variant and their relative. In absolute mode its size is determined by the O scale again and in relative it's scaled according to grid size. the pipe's orientation, position and length can be set in the modifier. To make more pipe endings, simply duplicate the modifier and the drivers. The pipe material is also made by Hickory and improved by me. It's basically just a proof of concept like many things in this file and can be adjusted by the user as desired. 
three other materials that come with the blend file are the ground dirt, the normals and the height node. The ground dirt is supposed to be a proof of concept of ground integration look, so your ground bound machines look like they are actually standing on the ground. The height group node is a proof of concept of a height based gradient that can be used by your heart's desire. The edge and AO group node generate ambient occlusion and edge detection. The normous material is applicable for asteroid sprites. It displays the geometry based normals of the object with inverted green channel. The water reflection setup is a bit different than the rest. Most of models probably won't even touch it. What is in game water reflection? In Factory, the in game water reflection is a blurry, red on transparent sprite that is supposed to be the shadow of objects in water. We recreate that by taking yet another sun, letting it shine from 45 degrees frontal, and catching the shadow for further processing. Do mind that the in-game sprite also allows a blue channel for foam and a green one for the blending between normal and underwater sprites. Light groups in Blender allow you to assign specific lights to affect only certain objects in your scene. This gives you full control over how different elements interact with lighting, making it easy to adjust illumination separately in compositing. By enabling light groups in the view layer settings, you can render different lighting contributions as separate passes allowing for fine-tuned adjustments to shadows, highlights and colors without re-rendering the entire scene. This is especially useful for creative lighting setups and post-processing flexibility. We shall utilize that for normal versus light layer renders. To separate between the ambient lights and the object lights, we set up at least two light groups in the view layer path settings and then assign the world and our lamps to them. Please do mind that every view layer has its own set of light groups. In the next chapter we are going to look at how to further process the render passes. Now to the final step within Blender. This is the compositing tab. Here you can manipulate Blender's render results and even export multiple files at once. Up to the right there are the view layer visibilities. When they are on, the layer is going to be rendered. File outputs are only going to export something if the connected view layer is on. We got color, color mask, water reflection, shadow and light layers. If you don't want the file output to export something anyway, you can just mute it. The end panel has a factorial tab again, which allows you to mute or unmute all at once. If you got suggestions for more script additions, you can put them in the comments down below and I'll make an updated version of the file. You might wonder why we are exporting in 16-bit color depth and not in 8-bit. 8-bit is normally completely sufficient, but Blender does a bit of fuck up when it's trying to export pure black pixels properly. Due to floating point inaccuracies, it sometimes gets to 111 in RGB. That means our images are going to have artifacts, which lead to bigger file size and worse compression. We can evade that by just exporting in 16-bit and then converting to 8-bit afterwards. You see a lot of file outputs in the light frame. You may disable or delete the ones that are not your preferred method of exporting light layers. The upper one exports the light in color on black mode, no alpha. The second one makes all black pixels outside the object's silhouette transparent, which might be more visually pleasing. The third additionally to that also makes black pixels within the object silhouette transparent. The fourth option is the same as the first, but with a glare filter on it and the last one is the same but with an alpha on the black pixels again. Since water reflections are just one sprite most of the times, you probably only want to render it once and not a whole set of it. Once you have rendered out your sprites, you gotta convert them to 8-bit color depth as mentioned. You can do that by dragging the folder onto the 16 to 8 RGBA folder script. It will put the originals in a OG folder and the processed ones in the unrenamed one. That makes it handier because you only need to delete the OG folder and not rename anything. If you want to process a single file, you can drag a PNG onto the single script version. This one will overwrite the original file, however. The README file contains info about all the scripts, by the way. The next script you can use is the black to transparent one. It takes in photos again and makes black pixels transparent and also nulls the color values of transparent pixels, which saves space. You might want to use this script on any export that recombine the color space of the image because those tend to have a lot of artifacts behind alpha, which just increases file size. Lastly, we have the sprite sheet version 2 script, which is my version of a sprite sheet maker. I know there's a couple others out there too, just like Spritter or Spritter, whatever. Feel free to use any of them. 
In my script you can select the images you want to put into your sprite sheet. Pick an output file name and set the grid size and generate it. If you have a 2x2, 4x4 or 8x8 canvas and not only one but a couple, you can press one of the buttons at the bottom and it will create as many sprite sheets with that resolution as it can with the input images. For example 128 input images with 8x8 will create two sprite sheets with 8x8 grid size. As I've shown in the composition chapter, there are a couple of ways of exporting the light layer. Some contain alpha. Depending on how your compression method looks like, I personally use a lossy compression with P and Ju. A file with alpha might actually be smaller as one without. Again, just check what's best for your purpose. That's it. I hope I could help a lot of people with this file and tutorial. Um, I might post an updated file in the future. Um, take care and uh, goodbye.